Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our monthly infant toddler specialist webinar. This is Monique Wilkinson from OEL, and I have with me in the room Lisette Levy. And I'm going to take a moment uh, to unmute somebody and make sure that you all can hear me and see something on your screen. Let's see, Stephanie Simmons. I just unmuted you. Um, can you hear me? I can and, hear you. Okay, great. And you can see something. Do you see a PowerPoint on your screen? Yes, ma'am. Okay, awesome. Thank you. I'm going to mute you again now. Okay. So everyone, uh, we're very pleased to have a, a guest speaker today. Her name is Jackie Malone with the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. And I'm going to turn it over to her so she can tell us a little bit more about herself and begin her, uh, begin her presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm Jackie. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for attending. I have just a little brief, brief history. I've been in the field since 82, which tells you I've been around for a long time. And I started out in early childhood and then evolved into working with adolescents. And well, I started out with early childhood and families and then evolved into working with adolescents in a wilderness program and then came back to my roots to early childhood. And I've been here at the Family Study Center for the past three years. Um, prior to that, I was the director of a clinic where we had an early childhood focus for a couple of years. So my great passion, though, is really talking about reflective practice and how we, we help regulate both each other and the children we work with. And primarily in reflective practice, it is really about a couple of things, self-care and also it involves brain science. So with that, I'm going to get started. And I'm gonna ask you to suspend some disbelief with me today because I wanna introduce you to Zebra. Zebra is our friend and we're on a little mini safari out in Africa and we just get to be able, we, we this is gonna be kind of magical thinking. We get to talk to Zebra. And so Zebra is in with this herd and they're grazing and just a beautiful day and we're just chatting and zebra saying how easy life is. But then something happens. We notice that the zebra's ears start twitching and we notice that their noses are snorting a little bit and there's some pawing going on and our zebra's looking at the herd and the herd's looking at zebra and they're looking at each other and the next thing you know they take off running and they're fast and furious and they take off. Now, of course, the zebras don't usually have motorcycles, but I thought this was a funny slide. Um, our zebra is running really fast and the lion's chasing him. And at the end of this, we run back up to zebra and zebra's grazing again. And the lion in this story does not get anyone. Um, and we go up to zebra and we're like, wow, that was amazing. You were so fast, you were so quick and you were jumping so high and, and you were just amazing. And zebra is going to look at us and say, what are you talking about? And we're going to go, the lion, the lion, the lion that was chasing you. And Zebra's still going to look at us and say, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just sitting here eating. I'm grazing. The reason why this happens is that we have in our brains, our makeup, a primitive brain that we share with animals that has helped us survive. And this is going to help you become mini brain scientists in that the amygdala, which is this little thing right here, helps, is that it serves as our alarm center. So in this case of zebra, zebra, the zebras smelled something. They heard something that we didn't hear. They got a sense from the other zebras. Some zebras were closer to the lion than others. So they responded with alarms going off in their brains. Something signaled them there's danger. That then sent a message to the thalamus and hypothalamus in this area. And that was our command center in our brain and in zebra's brain. And so what that does is the command center then sends off messages to pituitary glands, adrenal glands, and all these chemicals are released to make us bigger, stronger, faster, so that we can escape the danger. The prefrontal cortex shuts off the alarm up in here. And what is really important is that what makes us different 
from zero is that we have this piece of memory and we not only have memory of the event but we also add meaning to it so the question is you're all sitting there wondering why is this important to us in early childhood well because in order for us to help regulate children and in working with if you're working with other educators and you're they're struggling and stressed you're going to want to help regulate them as well and in order to do that we also have to regulate ourselves so we have to be aware that when we're in this stress mode our bodies our heart rates are higher our blood pressure goes up we're sweating more there's all types of chemicals racing through our system and if we don't come to some sense of where our prefrontal cortex, our body shuts it down, those chemicals are still racing through our system. And that ties into the stress that we, re we experience in the everyday, where we do not take the time to slow down and to stop and get our bodies back into balance. And so if I start out at zero, and here in Pinellas County, we have something called Highway 19, for those of you who are local in this area, and everybody has this, this highway in there wherever they live. And you can start driving and be calm as anything, and then within maybe a mile, your stress is going up. So if I get to work and I'm going to see a child and a family and my stress level's at a nine, I'm going to carry that into that relationship with that family and child. I can't help them if I'm not taking care of me. And understanding the brain science of this is very important in order to, for us to do that. So when we're stressed, we're in fight, flight, or freeze mode. Um, and what we'll usually see, and this is not just about children, this is about us, okay? This is about the adults. We're, we're going to be more oppositional. We may not follow directions right away. We may think that we're fighting for survival. And it's not about respect or not doing what is asked. It's that we're in that stress fight mode. If we're in flight, we're disconnected, withdrawn, not paying attention, calling in sick, not um, just kind of vacating. And it, we can be actually physically present, but not emotionally present or mindfully present. And then if we've had this stress ongoing a lot, like day in and day out with nonstop, we could freeze. We're, we just turn off our emotions. We're unable. Um, and a lot of times you will see people shutting down. When a child is in an emotional state, they're not getting what they want or need. They're frustrated. They're angry. They're crying. All of these, these symptoms here is the same thing that we experience. So what do we do? We want to be self-aware, first of all. We want to be aware of what's going on in our bodies, because once we're aware of that, now we can have some accountability and we can also do something about it. We want to self-reflect, and that's called reflective practice. And we also want to manage our brain first, because if we don't have our brain situated, our, our command center has been turned off, everything is going back to normal, we're going to carry that into any relationship we work with. So on self-awareness, our thoughts are, we bring in our thoughts, what, what we're coming in with in the morning. Like I said on Highway 19, if I walk into the clinic and I haven't taken time out in the car to kind of bring myself down to a, to a balance, or if I'm not doing that while I'm driving, then I'm coming in stressed and I'm gonna come in with a different attitude, I'm gonna come in with a different energy, I'm gonna respond differently to what's going on around me or what's being presented to me. If you're in a consulting role, which many of you are, you, you're going to carry that into the consultation. You're gonna be interpreting what is going on in front of you through that stress. Our beliefs about behavior and what we're seeing. What we're going to do is we're going to have to, um, our beliefs about behavior impacts our view and suddenly our self view, but the view of what we're seeing. For instance, if I use the word um, attitude, let's use that as a good word. What 
do you all typically do when you see someone that you're working with who presents with quote unquote attitude? Anybody? You can type it in. Yeah, go ahead and type your responses into the chat box. I'm not sure I see anything. I don't see anything yet either. Maybe perhaps ask the question again. Okay, so the question is, what do you all do when you see someone or are interacting with someone that you would say has attitude? How do you interpret that? What do you do? What do you typically see with someone who has attitude? Someone typed a response into the question box and their response was avoid them. Okay, so we avoid someone with attitude. Good, excellent. Anybody else? So I'm, I'm going to challenge the person who said that or anyone. Tell me when attitude is a positive response or a positive behavior. So Jackie, some of the responses we're getting are um, uh, I smile. Uh, I ask them if they're okay. I know for myself I need to vent, so maybe that will help them. Uh, I approach in a calm manner. I always wonder why they're in such a bad mood. Perfect. Um, of being overly kind or and someone uh, was asking were we still using attitude as a good word it, it, that's and that that is the point is that is it a good word a lot of times we tend to see attitude as a negative whereas attitude may be an assertive behavior the person may not be um, it may not be a negative interpretation in other words somebody if I run into someone with attitude my immediate response is I'm thinking, oh, this is a negative, but is it really? So I have to reflect on me. I have to kind of sit back and go, my belief system about what that means and what this person is really presenting. And what they may be presenting is assertive behavior. They may be presenting um, expression, emotion, expression in the sense that I'm very adamant about this or I'm, I'm really excited about this, but to me it comes across as attitude. A really good example here is we were, another clinician and I were talking and, and she was describing a family and talking about the aggression. Well, the way she was describing it was she was describing how loud they were and how distressful that was to her. And as she was describing it, two other Others and I were sitting listening and we were interpreting what she was saying as, as they were aggressive. And finally, when we came back around, she goes, no, 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 they're not aggressive at all. And then we, what we came down to was that she actually allowed, when people raise their voices, that never happened to her home. So when she hears it, it becomes distressful to her. It has nothing to do with, with the family. It has to do with her process and her beliefs. So that is the point, is that attitude very much is, can be a positive, and it depends on our view and our lens that we're looking through. This is why self-reflection is so important, because we know that mirroring is an important process. And we, want, we have to remember that emotional regulation is going to be relationship dependent. The people we're working with, if they're stressed out and they, they don't, if they're feel, feeling that they've got too much on their plates as teachers and they are, um, they're, they're not staffed in a way that, and we, we all hear this a lot in consulting with preschools, they're not staffed correctly or they have too many kids or the children, the combination of children that they happen to have um, are, you know, are, are, all of them are very demanding. And what happens then is the stress level goes up, and if they're not emotionally regulated, then they're going to not be able to manage that classroom, and it's kind of like a snowball effect. It just keeps getting worse and worse. What we have to remember, and one of the studies shows that when you're looking at like in child welfare, if you look at reflective capacity of a parent, the more reflective capacity a parent has, the better off that child is going to be and the less abuse you see in a relationship. Um, reflective functioning is a human specific mental capacity and it gives us ability to recognize our own mental states and emotional states 
as well as others. But it also allows us to step back and kind of look at what we're seeing and really say, okay, I'm gonna look in the mirror and I'm gonna look at myself and see what this experience really means to me. Because if I can recognize how what it means to me first, if I can recognize the stress in my own brain and what my brain's doing, then I'm going to be able to go, oh, I need to take care of this before I help them. Any questions so far about that? And I, I cannot see the questions for some reason. I'm not sure what I need to do. Hi, um, Jackie, we will monitor, we've been monitoring the question box. So if any pop up, we will definitely um, okay. let you know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So reflective practice is we think differently so we can act differently. We're going to apply what we know, but we're also going to, by thinking differently and reflecting on how something is impacting us, we'll integrate those experiences in a meaningful new way. An example, again, in our clinic, what we do is when we talk about a consultation with a school or we talk about a case with a family and child, we do not talk about them. We talk about us in relation to them, which means that I might say, here's something that I've been doing. I've been trying to work with these folks and, and build up the skill level for the preschool classroom. And immediately what the first question that's going to come to me, and I know this is coming to me, is how do you feel when you're in that relationship with them? It's not about them. It's about me. And I have to process how I feel and how I'm viewing them to really have a good understanding and way of, of really providing services to them. So questions to ask ourselves and each other. So in an, any given example where you have gone into, you're, you're working with other staff members and you're, you're providing education and support and consultation, did you notice that this happened? Why do you think that this happened? First, we want to describe. Then we want to interpret. How did I feel when this happened? How did you feel when this happened? What thoughts were going through your brain? What, got, what were you thinking? Interpreting the experience for you yourself. And in the case of consulting with somebody, I would be helping them interpret the experience in them, for themselves, not necessarily about someone else. Then asking, does this happen in other situations? You're generalizing this experience now. When else does this happen? Why do you think that this happens? Now, the tendency a lot of times is somebody will say, well, the system is doing this, or you know, we don't have the right staffing. Okay, that's fine. Those are real situations. However, when you look at your feelings, where else does this happen, and why do you think that happens? And a lot of times what, what will come out, and when I recently I was working with one of the preschools, and then finally the teacher said, you know, I feel like I know a lot of things, but when these things go on and I get distressed, I feel like I don't know anything at all. And then what happens is I keep thinking, I don't know anything, I'm not really good at this, and it just goes downhill from there. So what we ended up doing was just talking about when we're stressed, what we can do about stress to get our body back in, in, in balance, but also how she could think differently about that. that. That just because it's a stressful day or a bad day doesn't mean all her knowledge and skills goes away. And something that simple made a really huge difference. You know, I can keep teaching and adding more things onto her knowledge base, but if she's feeling like that, then she's not absorbing the information. Because back to that brain, her brain is stressed, the chemicals are flying through her system, and it's really difficult to get to learning when all of that's going on. And then the last part of this is how can I use this? What can I do with this information? And that's applying the experience. So measuring our stress and managing our brain. Like I said, I can start out at zero. Um, and I'm getting dressed and I'm getting kids off to school and I go and spill coffee on myself. I have to then go back and change my clothes. I'm rushing out. Everybody's kind of dragging their feet. I'm trying to get everybody out the door. 
So my stress level has gone from zero to now, let's say I'm at four. I get in the car, I get start driving, there's an accident on the road, I'm running late, I'm now to a six, I drive in traffic, by the time I get to the clinic, I'm an eight. I have to do something about that before I start my work day. So this is, I, I'm a big fan of conscious discipline and Dr. Becky Bailey. Um, stop, drop, and roll is stop talking, moving, reacting, completely stop, and this can happen anywhere. I teach this to teachers, I teach this to kids, I teach this to parents. If you do this, stop talking, moving, reacting. Drop into deep breaths, just really slow breaths, maybe three or four breaths, and then roll back into whatever you were doing once you've calmed yourself. Um, I am calm and peaceful even in chaos. Now, I've, brought, I've actually had parents um, practice this, and they'll do it, and I'll time them. And usually, it's, it says 10 seconds, but usually it's three to four seconds, and they'll bring themselves back down. I've had kids practice it, and I've had teachers practice it, and they're saying, no, I can't do this because if I'm in the classroom, I can't stop and start taking deep breaths. And I said, of course you can, because if you look at how long it took you to do it just now, those kids are still going to be there. Unless there's a true safety issue, you can stop and take the time to do this. It's seconds we're talking about. So one way is, is, is getting your body back. Oxygen in your system helps slow everything down. And also there's uh, some other techniques where you can stretch, you can walk. Um, one of the things that when you're doing stop, drop, and roll, you can breathe and visualize that quiet place, calm place, happy place, the beach, whatever. I can actually do this and I can do it right now while I'm talking to you and have the palm trees swaying in the back of my head because I've done it so frequently. Um, heart breaths and affirmations, this is a different technique. Most of us know about belly breaths. Heart breath is when I inhale and my heart, I imagine my heart expanding and I exhale and I I imagine my heart again, and I imagine my heart getting bigger and my heart getting smaller as I. Jackie, could you repeat your last couple of sentences? You you faded out a little bit. Exhale of my happy place. What is interesting with heart breaths is that if you put yourself to a heart monitor, and I have done this again with myself and with clients, um, and including teachers. I have, you can see your heart rate when you're talking about a stressful situation is very erratic. When you do heart breaths, it actually brings it back into coherence. Uh, and I use, I actually have a thing that I clip to my, my computer so that they can see it and see it happening so that it's more believable. So these are all different techniques to reduce body stress. But once you are regulated, and, and again, the emphasis is on you regulating yourself. Go ahead. Hi, yeah. could, we have a question. Yeah. Somebody wants to know what is water yourself? Water yourself is drinking, <laughs> drinking lots of water. That we, uh, we can water plants, but we tend to, the last thing in the world that we do is we do not take in enough water and I'm not talking about sodas and teas and things like that water water yourself thank your body, you your body needs it and that's a good question thank you for asking so once you're regulated um, then it's really important to now shift to regulating their brain um, now this is in terms of children my responsibility is to keep you safe I need to help need you to help me keep yourself and everyone safe. It's important and expected that we will respect ourselves. It's important and expected we will respect others and we'll respect property. Sometimes I think what we do in our preschools, and actually just in general in schools, but I'm going to talk about the preschool specifically, is we end up having a lot of rules and we don't keep it simple. And it ends up being that we're spending more time trying to figure out rules for more rules when kids find their ways around it because kids are gonna be creative. They're being creative, they're constantly trying to learn. 
and we need to simplify things. We need to shift our thinking, and again, I'm gonna go back and forth between kids and the adults, not what is wrong with you. If somebody's not showing up to work, if somebody consistently is doing the same thing over and over again that they've done forever in teaching, and you're wanting them to try something new or to try add something on to what they're doing, not what is wrong with you, but what is happening to you, how is this affecting you, Instead of it was a mistake, oops, it's time to practice. The very things that sometimes we use with children, we need to use with each other. Uh, it's, it's really easy, I think, and I used to work in quality in a large system, and um, quality, just by the nature of quality improvement and continuous quality improvement, you're, you're monitoring. And when you're monitoring, you're looking for things to be done. You're, it's a checklist. You're looking to see, are they doing this? It's really hard to deliver that message when some place at a school or a group of people are not doing well to handle that, to, to let them know that they're not doing well, that here are the checklists and here's where your scores came out. But then what system issues, the tendency is to see that as a personnel issue instead of system issues. What system issues are operating here? Is it a stress level problem? Um, what can we do systematically to help so that these other things that we're wanting them to do can be done? What kind of holding environment can we put under them? And I think that's part of that shift. Um, one of the things in quality improvement that is um, kind of it's just like a mainstream thought is that when you have problems in a system, it's 85% the system and 15% staff issues. Um, I think it's real hard to hear that sometimes and it's real hard to adhere to that. But time and time again, I found that to be true in my work and, and when I was doing the quality improvement. Children want to know that am I safe and sued by establishing secure based safety. Adults who are working and who are ex, you know, experiencing a lot of stress and trying to do a good job, and I assume when I go in to consult that they're doing a good job, they want to know that their job's safe. They want to know that they're safe in terms of their relationships with others around them. And that's where establishing a secure base of helping if you're talking to directors, if you're talking to other teachers, how do you establish a secure base under them? How do you let them know it's okay, you're safe, now let's, let's kind of figure out how to learn. Let's figure out what we need to do to learn. And that's why I'll keep coming back to stress because typically stress is the first thing that gets in the way of learning anything new. For emotional states, if, now this is with children, they wanna know, am I loved, am I valued? Well, we, we all want to know that we're loved and valued as well. We wanna know that our skills are recognized. We wanna know that our strengths are recognized. And that comes through connection. And this goes back to what I said earlier. Regulation, emotional regulation, is relationship dependent. We are wired for connection. All of us are wired for connection. And connection is crucial to success. So if we can build those relationships and build those supportive holding, and I call it a holding environment, if we can build those holding environments with the folks that we're working with, we can build that connection. They're gonna know that they're valued they know that they're valued, they're more willing to listen to you, and they're more willing to try something new. Excuse me, Jackie? Yeah. Uh-huh. We have, we have a request to go back to the rules slide. Okay, and let me see if I can figure that out. <laughs> oh, here you go. Here? I believe so. Yes. Is there a question? We had somebody ask that, to see it again, so. Okay, just remember, and, and the problem, if you want to capture this, it's responsibility to keep you safe. I need you to help me keep yourself and everyone safe. Now, I've not only used this with preschoolers. I will say I've used this with adolescent boys. 
Um, I worked, I, I ended up in a, I was working in a residential DJJ Department of Juvenile Justice Center for boys. And, um, and we've got, you know, you have gang kids in there, kids that are, that they've gotten really tough and rough because of life circumstances. And that was my message to them. I'm going to keep you safe, but I need you to help me. You've got to help me be safe and keep yourself safe, everyone safe. And it was a collaborative effort. And once you presented that to them, they would engage with you. You've got to respect ourselves and others and property. And I noticed that the wording is it's important and expected. I'm not debating this. My expectation, you can say I'm not going to do it. That's fine. My expectation still holds. My expectation will not change. It's very different than mandating something. What I have found in families and kids and staff, when I've stated my expectation does not change, you can make that choice. However, I still expect you to do it. I have rarely had anyone, anyone really buck up against me. Um, and when it has happened, then we've had a sit down talk and it's been more of a relationship piece, not a, you're going to do this, but it's more of a, okay, let's talk about what's going on right now. And that comes out to be a very different spot. So can I move on? That's good. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. And I also want to remind all of our participants that this webinar will be recorded and posted on the OEL website and on OEL's YouTube channel. Okay, good. So when safe and secure and connected, this is when learning takes place and children are able to operate in the prefrontal lobe, okay? And this is also true for us, that if I'm feeling safe, secure, and connected, if I'm not stressed, I'm going to be learning. If I'm not in that space, then I'm not going to. It doesn't matter how many, you know, I, it, there are many times I remember working in a system where we, it was kind of, well, they need more training. Well, no, that's not what they need because we've trained and trained and trained. What's not taking? Something wasn't, the, the training wasn't being used. Well, probably because it's more information bombarded on the top of other information, bombarded on top of other information, and no one's paying attention to the stress level ha and helping people integrate. Engage in play, connection, encouragement. I am huge now. This webinar is really different for me because in my workshops, when I'm doing them, I'm engaging in play. There's an there's going to be some kind of interactive activity going on because we know that in order to learn, we've got to you've got to have at least what 400 repeti uh, repetitions of something to really learn it. Play is the only place that you get that. You can it, what we find is I'm sorry. <laughs> for our providers too. What did I hear? Oh, <laughs> you were I muted. apologize. I forgot to mute my phone. That's okay. So, if we need 400 repetitions, repetitions to learn, it's interesting that in play, you you get that in 10 or 15 repetitions because play engages all the senses, engages all the learning styles. And also when we're safe and secure, our executive functions operate well. We're able to problem solve, decision make, expression, express ourselves better, we learn. So things that you can say, um, this is again to children, but I'm going to say that it applies to you and I as well. If somebody comes to me and says, wow, you were really ticked off, I'm going, no, I'm not. Deny, deny, okay. And they say, well, Jackie, it's interesting because if I look at your face, this is how you're looking. And they'll make a face at me. Now, I actually had somebody do this to me. I just started laughing because they were right. <laughs> but when they actually mirrored it back to me, it was, and, and again, do you want to do that with all adults? No, but with me, it was okay. Um, you might describe it in another way using words. But name the feeling that you believe is going on and then acknowledge the intent. Wow, I, you know, and with children, like a lot of times a child will, um, like somebody who grabs a toy, their, their intent was not to take something away from someone. Their intent was to play with the toy. 
we react to it as though they're taking something away and that's a negative. If I say, oh, wow, you really wanted to play with that toy, we're going to have a very different conversation. If somebody doesn't do something I ask them to do, if, I, if we train someone in a certain technique in a classroom and they go back to some technique that we don't want them to do, um, their intent is to try it, but it's not a practiced thing. And so for me to assume that they're just being resistant or just pushing back and not wanting to do it, it's going to end up in a negative space and they're not going to, they're definitely not going to do it with me thinking that way. And I'm really not going to be connected to them. However, if I think, wow, they're really trying, but it's, there's some kind of glitch in getting it into that, that, you know, where we all get comfortable, like an old shoe where it's practiced and, and we feel comfortable using it. If I don't have that kind of conversation with them and kind of figure out what the barriers are, the personal barriers, or maybe the system barriers, then we won't get anywhere. So the messages need to be for adults and kids. You're safe. I'm here with you. We're going to get through this. I'm going to hang in with you. If I'm teaching someone again a new technique, I'm thinking in one system we had on these assessment tools, the measures changed on everyone. And you could just see the blank stares and the like rolling eyes and, oh my God, now what? Um, we just learned this other one and now we're changing it again. And so, okay guys, you know what? I know it's frustrating, but we're gonna be with you. We're gonna get through this and hey, we're gonna hang in with you. We know it's gonna take some time and it's okay. Um, and then we were there side by side with them, teaching them how to use the tool and, check, and kind of experiencing what they were experiencing, where, the, where they were running into problems, not just hearing about it, but actually doing it with them. That made all the, uh, the, the gains in that was just uh, priceless. And I get it. What is other things to say for emotional stage? You're feeling this. Do you remember when you felt like this? Do you? And then you felt differently after maybe, do you remember when you felt like this when you, um, the last time we had to make a change and you were frustrated with the change, but then you were able to do it and you felt a lot better because you told me how well you were doing. Let's try to figure that out. And helping a child or a person moving from I'm mad and to I'm feeling mad and know the distinction on that, that I am not my feelings. I have feelings, but they are not who I am. And that is a huge distinction. Um, I, I have a mind. I am not my mind. Describe, again, this is going back to working with kids specifically, describing, you know, how their face looks, name it, acknowledge it. And then with kids, we want to move them to a routine activity. One-on-one -on -one time, close proximity, check-ins, have them do deep breaths, tune in. And then if you think about this, apply this to adults. I want them to get into a routine activity with something new that I'm teaching them. How am I going to help them do that? I don't just teach it and then assume they're going to figure it all out on their own. I want to help them figure out, okay, how do we make this routine? What do you think it's going to take to get this to a routine? And what can I do to help you? Not, here's the training and you guys figure it out. Um, I might have to be more on top of something new that's being taught, meaning I need to be in close proximity. I need to help. I need to check in more frequently. How is it going? How are you doing? That type of conversation. Um, I also might have to remind people to slow down and take deep breaths and just really try to find ways of when we are in this, and I'm thinking about, I'm moving back and forth between children in consultation, but they're really very similar, that I will try to find the words for the, or get them to describe words of the activity they're trying to do. Now, I'm going to use a kind of odd situation. I also, I happen to, I weave and spin yarn, as one of my uh, stress reducers. And I was teaching, I was doing a demonstration here locally in Pinellas County, 
with a group of people and the kids wanted to try kids were coming up and they wanted to try to spin and so i was trying to show them how to spin yarn on a spinning wheel and it was really interesting they weren't getting it and i finally stopped one of the boys i said here you sit down and when i do this and i i showed how i drew the yarn out i said what do you call that and he called it something and then i said okay and what do you call this when i pinch the yarn he called it something he didn't call it what I called it. He called it what he called it. He used his own words, own language. I repeated what he taught me to him, and he was able to spin the yarn. I then used the same words for the next child, and they got it. When I was trying to use my words, not working, when I used their words, it did. Same thing. If I want to understand what's getting in the way of teaching something new and someone is stressed, I really want to use the words that they're using, have them describe it to me, and me reflect and mirror their words. Um, and I'm going to skip, well, part of this, well, I'm going to go back to this. Okay. So one of the things that we want to do, and this is getting into more exact work, um, and again, I think it applies to adults as much because I've used this with families. So it's okay to have feelings. We all know that. It's okay to talk about feelings. Um, and then there's some techniques for those who've heard of Dan Siegel that I, I think it's real simplified because what he has done is he has taken brain science and applied it to our upstairs brain, which is our executive functions to the downstairs brain which is that amygdala and the primitive brain and making connections there but there's also the left and right brain the left brain is more tends to be more logical that's where a lot of our logic our problem solving is and then also the right side of the brain is more the emotional creative intuitive and there's all this interaction that's going on in our brains all at one time so what he has done is separated out some techniques to help you engage upstairs, downstairs, like if you're not regulated, to get regulated, but also to move from logic and emotion to, or emotion to logic. So one of the first things is engage, don't enrage. Be in supportive, but do not negate what a child, and again, I'm going to say or adult, is saying by saying it's okay, it's not a big deal. Um, if I were to go into a training with adults and say, it's not a big deal, I mean, this is just a change, it's not that big of a deal, come on, get over it, I'm not going to get very far. And if anything, they're already feeling it is a big deal, or they wouldn't be having the feelings they're having. So the same thing with kids. So you want to engage them in a conversation with, I know this is going to be difficult, it, it, it's, any change is hard. And it's also, there's all this learning curve that goes on and we all have our different learning curves. So it's gonna be a big deal that we, again, we can get through it together, but let's talk about what those big deals are gonna look like. And some other strategies for integrating parts of the brain. So this is also post calming the stress system down. Connect and redirect. You want to connect with the emotion that someone is feeling and reflect that feeling to them. And then once they understand you recognize the feeling, you can move, perhaps we can do this, or perhaps we can move on and find another way to get this done. Name it to tame it. Name the emotion the child's feeling or the adult and let them know that you understand that, wow, I see this is really frustrating for you. Um, I can, you look like this, I can tell by the facial expression. Or it could be, you know, your facial expression just looks like you're frustrated, How, what's going on? Because sometimes I may interpret an expression as frustrated when it's actually something else. Um, I actually had a dad challenge me <laughs> because I interpreted something, a facial expression he had, and he said, that's just how I look when I'm thinking. And I was trying to, I had made it into some big feeling, and it was like, he nailed me on that one. And um, But it was really funny, later we were laughing about it, he and his, his wife and I were laughing because it was like, okay, they got me, <laughs> you know. 
Um, use it or lose it. A lot of times what happens is we, we go in and we, um, we talk about, we train, we teach, we do all these things, but we don't allow daily practice. I, 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 you know, I remember I used to be really, really excellent in math when I was in high school. And then I got into a field that doesn't require a lot of math. And now, you know, if I go back and look at it, I, I feel like I'm a beginner all over again. Of course, I don't know how many of you have teenagers and some of I mean, even the fourth and fifth graders are coming home with these really unusual math problems. And I don't know about you, but I sure can't help them on it. <laughs> So if I, I've obviously lost it, um, but if I were to practice it again and again, then I could gain it back again. So it's keeping that in mind that many times people aren't not doing something. They are simply haven't been practicing it enough to maintain it and back to that repetition. Move it or lose it. Um, activities, physical activity is priceless in stress reduction. It's also priceless in helping us learn. When we sit for extended periods of time, I have a watch that now alerts me, and I didn't set it this way, it did it automatically, um, that it alerts me to stand up every hour on the hour. And at first I was kind of ignoring it, and then I started thinking, man, eh, maybe this is a good idea. And so I've started doing it, and what I've noticed is that when I sit back down again, I'm focused. I'm much more focused than I was. So moving it or losing it, um, gazing, gazing children or gazing, engaging adults when you're in a training like now of getting up and doing something where there's some movement and then you go back to work. And many of us will say we don't have the time to do this. And it's hogwash. You have the time, it, standing up, moving around, taking a quick walk down the hallway and back takes 10 seconds, 15 seconds at best. Um, if we would all do that, I think it's much easier to come back and be focused and, and learn or teach in whatever we're doing. Remember to remember is a technique of, instead of how was your day, ask what was the best part of your day really helping somebody remember experiences, but we really want to get, grasp those positive experiences, the feel good experiences. We're not trying to ignore the negatives, but we really want adults and children to learn to connect that this was a real positive thing that I can carry into the next day. And again, I'm going back to stress levels in the body. If I'm thinking about those positives, I'm not Relief. I'm not my my amygdala is not serving as an alarm center. It's not sending to the, my command center. Stress, stress, stress. Send out the hormone. Send out all those hormones because we need those chemicals because there's 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 danger here. We that's how we become stressed as we interpret things as dangerous to us. Let clouds of emotions fly by, feelings come and go. That's a really nice visual if you want someone to kind of think about, you know, yeah, this has been really stressful right now, and yeah, you're right. Today was just a rough day. The kids in your classroom were bouncing off the wall, and you were trying so hard, and you had things to do, and you didn't get this done that you were expected to do today. It's just like those clouds. They're floating by. They're going to go on and there'll be new clouds tomorrow. And just kind of attach it to the clouds and let it go. Exercise mind sight, the infamous smell the flower, blow the candle out, belly breathing, muscle relaxation. Um, adults can do it at their desk. And I had, again, and I actually do this. I'll do muscle relaxation, progressive relaxation. For those of you that don't know, it's you start out at your toes and you strength, you tighten your toes, your ankles, your calves, your thighs, and you just hold it in tension, take a deep breath, and then relax and let it go. Do that a couple of times, do it all the way up to your neck. You could do it in less than two minutes and your body has already come down a few notches on that 
stress meter. Have fun every day. Uh, work, get work done, but play. We work in early childhood where play, and I believe in play in all ages, but play. We have forgotten ourselves how to play. And how it's not just the kids playing, it's us getting down and playing too. Um, playing can be anything from, like I said, I weave, but I also do mosaics. So playing for me is working on a mosaic at home. Playing for me is being out in the yard and watch, you know, setting up bird feeders. Being, I, I just have a whole lot, a hundred lists. And if any of you need a list of things to do, send me an email. I'll be glad to send it to you. Um, that I'm constantly finding new things to play with. And then learning every day, making sure that we're working, playing, and learning every day. And connecting through conflict. This comes back to that belief system, how you view conflicts. Are they a problem or are they opportunities to learn for both you, children, and the adults you work with? Um, Connection, conflicts can actually be challenges for, for all of us because typically a conflict will arise out of us having one agenda, somebody else has something else on their mind or some, another agenda, and they're not jiving together. And getting that out on the table, it's just like, do I really want to do this? It's going to be a hassle. We're going to end up in an argument. All these things are going through your head when what you can do is just say, you know what, let's get it out there. I, I was asked to come to you all and, and we are instituting this new technique or this new um, system in your school. Let's talk about what that means, what meaning that brings to you. Let let those folks talk. You still have what you have to do, but unless we understand how people are viewing what we're doing, um, it's going to be a constant conflict, and it will they'll they'll learn basics of what we're teaching, but they will not follow through on them. And part of that, it, again, back to connection and relationship, emotional regulation, also learning is that it's going to be relationship dependent. It's how we are connected and how we are listening and how we are paying attention to how we're feeling at any given moment and how we're approaching those folks. That's going to be part of the success. The more we practice, I use the phrase of a comfortable, a pair of comfortable shoes. You just practice the skill, one skill at a time, our tendency is to give a whole lot of skills at once and then it's overwhelming to people. One skill, then add another skill after everyone has practiced, practice, and they're reporting some success. Granted, that slows the whole system down, but I, I really would question, I wonder if anyone's ever done any research on how much time has been invested in trainings that never get anywhere because people don't apply them, as opposed to if we just took one small section at a time, would we have a better over time outcome of skills being used? Said visual reminders, it's not about the child or someone else's behavior, but about your ability to help them make a brain shift and your ability to make shifts in thinking and beliefs and your ability to calm yourself to be aware of yourself. So that gets back to self-care. Take a moment to breathe before your day starts at the home and car. When I arrive to work, I'm automatically breathing. Like I sit in the car for about three minutes and I take deep breaths and just kind of collect myself and then I come in. When I get back in the car, when I'm getting ready to leave today, I will do the same thing. And I've been doing this for a while now, and I'm, I'm a really big, I have my own little monitor for my ear that um, I, I do heart math. And so I actually have an app on my phone where if I really want to know, I can see if my heart is in coherence, it'll tell me what my heart's doing. And it's really interesting. I've now gotten to where I can do this on the road and, and not, I mean, I'm tuned in driving, but I'm actually 
keeping myself in a really calm state. So any questions about any of this? or thoughts or, and, and one of the things I'm always interested in is feedback from you all, like what worked, what didn't work, feel free. Jackie, as of right now, we don't have any questions in our question box. Okay. So, um, oh, here comes one, hold on one sec, let's see. Oh, we have people saying thank you. Oh, thank you. And I'll go ahead, uh, just some, this book, The Whole Brain Child is an excellent book. All three of these books are good, but this one, The Whole Brain Child, he also has a workbook that breaks down some of the concepts into smaller steps. I highly recommend them. Um, but all three of these folks, and I know most of you probably are very well aware of Alvarado and Bailey. We have several more thank yous, and especially from folks that are in the uh, hurricane uh, recovery area in the Panhandle. Uh, they are saying that uh, this uh, this information is going to be very helpful for them. Thank Good, you. I'm glad. Thank you, and thank you to all of you for everything that you guys do. Um, if you have any questions, this is the email address, so feel free to call. And I'm always interested since, I, like I said, I'm usually an, ex I'm an experiential therapist and educator, so I do everything experientially in person. So this is a very different thing for me. So I would, I'm very open to feedback on what worked, what didn't work, what would work better. Um, dialogue is really good about that. So any feedback you all have, please send it on. Thank you so much. We had another comment from uh, from one of our participants who says that she's currently working with a teacher that has challenging behavior, so she f will also find this information very, very useful. Good, and I ho hopefully that, I hope it works, and let me know if it does. Well, Jackie, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and uh, again, any if anyone that's on the line right now has any uh, questions or any comments, for Jackie, her email address is, is there for you, and feel free to send uh, feedback to her. You can also send feedback uh, to me here at OEL. And uh, our next uh, webinar is on April the 9th, and we will have Holly Wilcher from the Office of Child Care joining us again for her presentation on strength-based coaching. So if there are no other questions or comments, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We had awesome attendance today. We're thrilled by that. And we hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.